Folks, good morning. My name is Peter Capelli. I'm professor of management here at the Warden School and director of our Center for Human Resources. My colleague, Mike Yusim, who's also a professor here and director of our Leadership Center, the McNulty Center at Wharton, and I are hosting this series of interviews. This is our virtual version for annual leadership conference, and it's also a joint uh, program with our Knowledge at Wharton partners, so we're beaming this around the world and it will be available later for you on podcast version. With us today uh, to talk about leadership, every year we try to bring in some people who are not just leaders, but people who study leaders and observe them. And it's a great pleasure to have Sydney Finkelstein with us. Sydney is a professor at the Tuck School at Dartmouth, Tuck School of Business, a Stephen Roth professor up there. He also heads their executive education program. He's a longtime observer and expert in the field of leadership, and we're going to talk to him a little bit about his book, Super Bosses, and the more recent uh, addition to this, the Super Boss Playbook that uh, he's developed has come out recently. Sydney's joining us from Dartmouth up in New Hampshire. Sydney, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Great to be talking to you and all the folks uh, beaming in. Great. Uh, Sydney, you want to talk just a little bit about uh, your book, because you spend a fair amount of time, not just in this book, but in your classes and generally talking to leaders. And let's start with uh, the book. If you could just tell people a little bit about why you wrote this book. Super Bosses is a great title, and I think it does suggest to people what you're after here. But you went around interviewing these folks and spending some time with them and watching them. Uh, tell me a little about why you were trying to do this book as opposed to something else about corporate leaders. Right. No, it's a great it's a great question. I had uh, written earlier um, uh, a book called Why Smart Executives Fail, which is about failure and what goes wrong. And uh, one of the things that came out of that research as I went to work with a lot of companies and gave speeches around the world is, you know, this is great. We understand what can go wrong. But what what do you really need to survive and thrive into the long term as an organization? And it got me uh, on a path to think about, you know, what really is the the most important thing. And I, and I came up with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis was uh, to survive and thrive, to be successful into the long term, you need to be able to generate and regenerate talent on a continuous basis. And uh, I set out to find people who had that track record and then do deep dives into them and all of their protégés and colleagues to try to see what is it that they did that's different than typical leaders, even successful leaders, and what can we learn that maybe we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really interesting hypothesis, and I think uh, in the past generation, one that probably didn't get a lot of attention when you talk to people about leading and being successful in business, you get a whole lot of discussion about strategy, you get a whole lot of discussion about managing financial markets, and you don't really hear that much about developing talent from within. What kind of reaction did you get from your publisher or other people when you first started to do this? Did you get a sense of people say, yeah, that's really important, or they say, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting. Uh, it was almost like they were, they were waiting for this deep dive because any CEO you talk to, in fact, when I talk to them, uh, as you have 20 years ago and 10 years ago, and you ask them what keeps you up at night, what are you worried about? It, it's always the same thing, right? Uh, how do I find the world's best talent? How do, I, how do I develop them? How do I, how do I retain them? And they keep having the same problem year after year, decade after decade. Now, why is that? Because we haven't come up with solutions that have really moved the needle very much. And that, that's the reaction I got. People said, okay, some of, this, some of these ideas around super bosses are not kind of standard, uh, but maybe that's what we need. And uh, so the reaction was, uh, wow, this is a different way to think about things. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to pause on that one for a second, because when you look at these surveys of CEOs, they say exactly what you say, right? Yeah. That the top concerns are about uh, talent. But... The, that perception never gets passed, uh, never seems to get out there. My guess is if we polled our listeners right now what they thought was keeping executives up at night, that would probably not be top of the list. But as you say, in practice, it is. And it is in all the surveys, the conference board survey. And things. Why do you think that is? Why do you think this topic and your dive into this is something that is not more broadly Appreciated? Is it just not as much fun to talk about this as it is to talk about strategy or something? What do you think? No, I think um, the idea that people count, that people are our most important asset. I mean, we've heard that forever, and people's eyes glass over. And so I think that, and because it hasn't really happened, because work 
uh, is just not easy, and there's been more and more pressure put on on rank and file to managers to senior managers. Uh, I, I think uh, I think many people will say, yeah, they're t uh, uh, they might say that, but they don't really believe that. What they really believe is is hitting the numbers and pushing us harder and making us work uh, work harder and give up more. And uh, and so there's some there's a lot of cynicism, and I think that that could be what's behind this. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about about your book, and maybe you could tell us a little bit, maybe first about the people that you interviewed and how you picked them, because there's a huge list that one could draw from, um, right. and you're trying to find some best best players here. So tell us a little about who and how you got to them. So I was um, I started off kind of small, looking at one or two industries that I that I care about that I'm interested in. So the high end foodie industry, you know, chefs and restaurants. Then I, I, I looked at the National Football League. There's another thing I'm interested in. Uh, so it was kind of like just playing around at the beginning, to tell you the truth. Uh, and what I what I did is, uh, so for example, the NFL is a really good example. I was interested in head coaches and the development of head coaches and who was really good at it. And the NFL is a great example because there's really good data. And what I did is I looked at the Super Bowl winners and losers, the winning team and the losing team each year, so the two best teams. I looked at their head coaches. And I did kind of a, a genealogical study of them, not, of course, their parents, but who they work for. And I created these kind of trees of talent. And when you do that, you discover that there's one or two names at the very, very top over, over decades. And actually, the, the name at the very top is Bill Walsh, the legendary and longtime coach of the San Francisco 49ers, now, now passed away. And so I was able to actually quantify it in that industry really, really well. In other industries, I had to do a lot of grunt work, and a lot of hunting, a lot of qualitative research. Uh, but it turned out in every, literally every industry I looked at, I was able to find the one, sometimes two people that had this outsized influence development of talent. So, for example, in hedge funds, Julian Robertson from Tiger Management, Tiger Cubs, I mentioned, you know, high-end foodie restaurants, uh, Alice Waters from Chef Panisse, the creator of the California cuisine and many of the trends in food that we see today from farm to table, the organic, the local sourcing. Um, um, endowments in universities and other nonprofits. David Swenson from Yale University is kind of legendary, has many of his protégés involved in, uh, in running funds and running endowments now. Um, in, in, in fashion, in the fashion industry, American fashion industry, Ralph Lauren. In the comedy industry, uh, Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live. Um, I mean, it goes on and on. And, and you go and look at these people and you say, wow, they have they have a track record of generating and regenerating talent really on a continuous basis. And, and the other thing you discover about them is not only do they create these opportunities for people and help people be more successful in their own lives and their own careers, they actually perform much higher than everybody else. And, and this is actually really interesting, Peter, because sometimes people ask me, you know, they, they say, you know, Sid, we don't have time to spend all, uh, we don't have all this time to try to develop our people. They got to figure it out. I went to the School of Hard Knocks they got to figure it out. And, and, I, and I say, can you imagine a situation when your team is getting better and better and better, where you yourself won't benefit from? Is there such a situation where you will be punished for helping the people around you get better and as a result, make you better? It doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, but that's kind of what, uh, what, what happens. So um, uh, not only developing talent, but being among the highest performers in their industry. Mm -hmm. I must say, I, I'm really envious of the idea of picking high-end restaurants as a subject to, to study. That's a smart one. I'll try to remember to. A lot of fun. A lot of fun research, I have to say. <laughs> so let's go back to that. Uh, I, I think one of the points you made, which is which is really important for people listening around the world, is that your legacy matters a lot. And uh, presumably, you got to these and identified these people because their descendants, people who had worked for them, were willing to say you know, this is the person who really helped me, right? Uh, which is a really important thing too at the end of our careers. I'm going to a lot of retirement parties, you know, of older executives and they always talk about that, you know, who uh, who I thought I helped and how important that was. But let's move back to the book here a little bit and so get to the, the heart of this. So what did these folks do to develop talent? I, I imagine it's not just sending them to the Tuck School or to the Wharton School and that sort of stuff. What did what did they do that was fundamental in development? Yeah, well, there, there's a lot, but let me highlight maybe two or three things real real quick. Um, number one is how they source talent, how they find talent. They're very uh, they're very open minded. These super boss leaders, they're looking for talent all the time. I almost I call them almost entrepreneurial 
in how they think about talent. Anywhere they go, everywhere they go, their antennas are up to, to look for potential for potential talent. Uh, and as a result, they, they often find people have been bypassed by, by others, uh, which I think is really uh, interesting because it creates opportunities for, for people. So there, uh, there's a lot more I could say about that, but they, they cast a wide net and they're very open-minded. They're, they're also um, um, creative. They value creativity. I say they unleash creativity to people around them. And this is particularly important for millennials, but I think it's important for everyone. You know, what do we want? We want a seat at the table. We want to have a chance to have an impact. The best people think that way. High aspiration people think that way. You don't have to be, again, an MBA graduate from a top school to think that way. And, and so super boss leaders will give you that seat. And, and they'll give you that seat and therefore expect a lot from you. And that goes hand in hand. It's not a, you don't get tenure in that seat. You have to produce and, and you're expected to keep coming up with new ways of thinking. Uh, along with doing whatever your day job happens to be, it's it's kind of it's kind of standard in how they and how they think about uh, how they think about things. And, yeah, so and then, they, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say they get accountability, right? So they get some oh, yeah. responsibility and accountability. Yeah. They they really they really do. Uh, and you know, in, in kind of related to that is uh, when you talk about motivating people, there's a lot of ways to talk about talk about motivation, but there's kind of two major things we found among super boss leaders. Number one is they push you hard, they raise the bar. It's not an easy place to work uh, with respect to the demands and the expectations. Not for, it's not for everyone. But if you're a high aspiration person that wants that opportunity, uh, you're gonna jump at it. And then the second thing they do is they inspire you. It's kind of, you know, kind of a word we hear all the time, right? But they really do. They inspire you to believe that you're the person you're the, that you're the team that can accomplish this, that you're, that, that with you, we can do these great things. And sounds, maybe sounds a little soft, but you combine both of those together, kind of the hardcore, you know, we're going to be tough. We're going to have these high demands. And at the same time, you know, we, I'm inspiring you to feel like, and be, really believe that you, that we together can do anything. That combination turns out to be pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just tell people a little bit about the kinds of people that you were talking about. Can you, Tell us who these folks were. Yeah, so, um, well, I mentioned a couple. Bill Walsh, the uh, the head coach from the San Francisco 49ers, and, you know, Ralph Lauren, who, you know, people know the name Ralph Lauren, but the number of people that work for Ralph that went on to tremendous success in their own careers is really unbelievable. You know, Vera Wang and Tori Birch and Abud and John Barbotos. And, I mean, it goes, it goes on and on. The CEO, Michael Kors, John Idle. So that, that's, another, that's another great example. Uh, in the um, uh, in the food business, high end food business, I mentioned Alice Waters. It turns out that there are over 250 people that worked in her restaurant at some point that have become um, significant players in that ecosystem. And I, I don't mean just you know a sous chef becoming a chef, but someone who may have been baking to that creates a big bakery company. To even this, people that were involved in running the running her restaurant are now some of the people involved in private equity and venture investing in food businesses. Really, it's really kind of uh, kind of amazing. So it's um, uh, lots and lots of industry uh, industries. Tommy Frist in healthcare is another is another good example. Um, um, Larry Ellison at uh, at Oracle, which a lot of people give me grief over because there's no tougher executive that we know of, CEO, former CEO that we know of uh, than him. But if you could survive working for for Ellison, uh, the upside was unbelievable. Um, mm -hmm. Many of his top people ended up running gigantic. You know, I wanted to ask you about uh, my favorite category out of your category of uh, sort of personality types of these folks, and that's the glorious bastards. Yes. Um, and is Alice in one of those? Just tell, tell us what's a glorious bastard. He's my poster boy. <laughs> Larry <laughs> Ellison's my poster boy for the glorious bastards. Yeah. But this is the thing to keep in mind. Uh, the, the word glorious is in front of bastard, right? There's plenty of bosses that, are, that qualify for, you know, the latter, the latter adjective. But what makes them glory, what makes these people glorious, like a Larry Ellison, is they understand that to be successful, they need to have the world's best talent around them, and they need those people to keep getting better and better. So while they might not care a lot about you interpersonally, if you can handle that pressure, they're just going to accelerate your career. It's it's almost like somebody I think said this to me in one of my interviews. Working for Larry's like uh, we counted in dog years. One year of working for Larry's like seven years working for somebody else. Yeah, no, I could certainly see that. Uh, let's see if we could switch topic a little bit because we we're mindful of your time and 
the audience here and, and you've been watching this world for a long time. And in the last year, particularly with respect to the pandemic, uh, it looks like the context of business is changing quite a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about what you think businesses, business leaders will be like after, well, I mean, from now on, we're in the middle of this pandemic now, what's it demand from these folks that might be different, do you think? Right. You know, this is, this is obviously a watershed moment and we can, we can also um, uh, talk about the, uh, the, the the racial crisis that has come that has come in front of, of the country and cannot be denied anymore. Uh, and leaders are, are uh, and CEOs in particular, but leaders more generally uh, are really expecting to are expected to step up and do do things maybe a little bit differently than they have. And and that starts with uh, transparency, being completely transparent about what it is you're saying, as opposed to kind of manage it, as opposed to, you know, we're in an era of fake news, but the stand-up leader has never been more important. That's why, you know, so many people resonate with Governor Cuomo from New York to become such a star. You know, he's been far from perfect, but he's up there day after day with a message that conveys action and seriousness of, of, of intent and, and maturity. And, and what's the result? It generates trust and it boosts the confidence of the people, of the people around you. And so I think that that, um, attribute of what it takes to be an effective leader, to gain the trust of others is going to be even, it's always been important, but it's going to be even more important. And then, then the other thing I'd say, um, and there's a lot more to say, but the other thing I'd say is, how is business changing and going to change because of this? Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you and everyone from my uh, dining room right now. People are home. Uh, people are working from home and, and that's not going to disappear. Uh, when we eventually get get back to uh, get back to work as normal, and what does that mean for managers? How do you manage a team when they are much more likely to be virtual, uh, some or all of the time? And and learning how to do that, I think, is going to be is going to be more is going to become more important. And then there's some kind of nuts and bolts things: supply chain management. We've discovered because of the the problems with uh, PPE uh, that these long, complex, highly efficient supply chains. Uh, didn't give us any flexibility uh, to be able to kind of step in and 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 produce what we needed in real time, and that turned out to be a big that turned out to be a big uh, a big problem. And, and then speed of work, I'm going to say, I think is really is really important. You know, um, the the pace that decisions are being made. We don't even have to talk about the the, the pace of you know anti antibody treatments and other treatments and vaccines, of course, which you know hopefully will will get there. Uh, but the pace that it's going on is, is, is tremendous. And, and, and so we've kind of knocked away a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of, oh, we better study this and study this and study this. Well, now the alternative is something really, really bad. So we're doing less studying and more action. And many CEOs I've talked to over the years, they some have said something like, you know, I don't have to be right all the time. Nobody's right all the time. If I'm, if I'm right more than half the time, that's pretty good. As long as I know when I'm not right, I step in and do something about that and try to fix it. That's, that's going to be, I think, a central part of what makes for an effective leader moving. We're going to get to our questions in just a second here, but I got one more for you before we get there. And that is, um, if you think about the CEO today and a lot of challenging social questions, the Black Lives Matter issue is right on the table right now. Um, and what do you think about uh, CEOs who are in a position where maybe their personal beliefs and uh, what's going on in society are not particularly well balanced? So, for example, we saw this earlier on gay rights, for example, LGBT community issues. Not all the CEOs were in favor of those, but maybe their employees were. What do they do there? Is it just better to keep their mouth shut or do they have to articulate positions that make sense for the organization, even if it's not their personal positions? What, what do you see yeah. happening? So this is really a big, uh, a big challenge because it goes against, it, it puts in conflict two kind of core things that every leader is told about. One is you got to be authentic. You got to be true to yourself. And, and so there, there's one. And then the other, which is even bigger, uh, is how business goes, which is customer focus. We're all about customer focus. Well, you know, we're not going to sell uh, our customers what we think is the right thing to do, the right, the right product, unless we believe the customers really want it and we have to convince them. You know, Steve Jobs is kind of this, people say, what about Steve Jobs? He created this stuff. Nobody knew we needed an, I, an iPad or, or a pod for that matter. Well, there's one Steve Jobs and there's uh, probably 100,000 others 
that'll fail trying to do the same type of the same type of thing. We can't make you know leadership uh, practice based on all these ultra exceptions. So um, uh, to follow your own beliefs, I think uh, uh, when when that's not what the your ecosystem is demanding is a, is going to be a really is going to be a real problem. And it might it might fall on boards of directors to start to think about value systems at a very personal level when they start hiring and evaluating CEOs. Uh, because okay. there, there is a fit, and you know, if if, if employees are are in revolt, if, if the managers are not happy with the way the CEO is running the business because of certain values that are out of touch, that's that 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 just that's not going to work. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think we are at the point in the show here where we turn to questions and answers. Um, and I hope I'm, I've got this at the right point. So great pleasure to have with us Steve Guglielmi who is our Knowledge at Wharton partner, the executive director there. And Steve has been listening to what people in the audience have been asking. And I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Peter. Hi, Sydney. Hi. Um, we, we, have, we have time for a couple of good questions. we got lots of questions here about talent development, attracting talent. Uh, so, so let's, I'll ask this one. How can leaders develop talent effectively while people are working remotely? Does that pose more of a problem? And the other question was, should, should maybe talent development be sidelined for the time being during this crisis? I'll take the second question. First, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, to to sideline talent development is to send a signal to people around you that, you know what, your, your future is, not, is actually not that important now. We, we got to do something else. Uh, how do you motivate people? You, you motivate people when they feel like they're part of something, they're contributing to something. So I, I don't think I would, uh, I don't think I would do that. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, that's not just about spending money, which is sometimes what motivates, you know, that type of mindset. That we we got to cut back when we don't have money, and training budgets are often among the very first things that that get that get cut when when times are tough. Uh, the best way to develop talent is for in, an individual boss or an individual leader to work directly with the people that work for her one-on-one. -on -one. The, that's the best way. That's what super boss leaders do, and it's not necessarily going off for training. Um, and and the, first, the first question was, uh, how, uh, again, Steve, how do you develop? What can we do to develop talent in this situation in, in the present environment? Yeah, given the fact that people are so dispersed and working oh, remotely, yeah, right. does, that, does that pose more of a challenge for talent, talent development? Yeah, well, it, it, it does. Uh, the fact that it, the fact that that's the way we are doing work and will continue to do work even more, uh, it's, it's just raises the degrees of difficulty. Uh, I always say, you know, like before all of this happened, when everyone's working from home or almost everyone is working from home, I used to say, well, there will be time, times when you're face to face. And when you're face to face, that becomes golden. That's an asset. That's really valuable. And you got to leverage that time. So for example, uh, you don't want your PowerPoint presentations. You don't want the updates from, from teams when, when you finally have a chance to be face-to-face. -face. That could all be done offline. You just got to be smart about it. When you're face-to-face, -face, it's, about, it's about talking. It's about learning. It's about interacting. It's about pushing and challenging. And so I'd say using your time much more effectively uh, and thinking about, you know, of all the things that we do, what could we actually push offline? And what, what do we absolutely need to be doing face-to-face? Uh, uh, so even though it's more difficult, it doesn't mean that it's going to go away. It just means it's got to get done. And, and this is another thing to keep in mind. The managers that figure out, the leaders that figure out how to do this more effectively are going to have a competitive advantage. Over and that's a pretty good incentive to try to uh, put your energy into that. Right, right. Um, and also during this time, do you have any advice for how managers can best lower employee anxiety while they work remotely? Because I think that it's a very anxious time not only because of what's going on in the world, but because things have changed dramatically. Most people are kind of in a zone now, but, but how can the managers help to lower employee anxiety during this time? Yeah, I think there are two things. One, one is uh, communication at a more general level. The best leaders, best managers know that they need to be communicating, communicating often and, and effectively. I think the bar has been raised on that too. Uh, you don't want to use up everybody's time all, all the time. People are working and their kids are running around the house and not everybody has childcare, et cetera. But um, uh, communicating what you're doing and, and what people are up to and where, and where you're going and, and inspiring people a little bit, I think, is, is important. And the, the second thing is more of an individual um, idea, which is for each individual on your team, 
carve out some time to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, not the big Zoom thing or the blue jeans thing or whatever it is. Um, and uh, uh, one of the best ways you can signal that you really care about somebody, and this will alleviate or help alleviate their anxiety, is if you, um, if, you, if, you, if you try to understand what it is they need and they want in their own careers at this point in time. And, and that could be, you know, starting to think about, well, you know, within, the, within a year, hopefully we're, we're on the other side and here's what I'd like to do and how we're going to continue. Or I have an aspiration to be, you know, uh, a senior VP or a C-suite executive here uh, to actually spend the time. Um, I hesitate to use the word coaching because coaching is a word used all the time and it's a little bit weak. I prefer almost like partnering as a better, as a better word uh, where you're not only providing advice, but you're actually um, helping them execute on, on, on this. So for example, if somebody needs certain skills to get to the next stage, uh, you help them figure out how they can get those skills with them. And if that means a new assignment, a new opportunity, you do that. So that's just good kind of managing people activity. But I think when you, when you do that, especially now, you're demonstrating um, in, a, in a real way, not just with words, which I think are important, but not just with words, in a very real way that, you know, you care about each individual person and you want them to succeed and you want to understand what's going on in their, in their lives now and work together to try to get them to the next stage, whatever that happens to be. Right, right. And I, I think that one, one issue that does come into play in these scenarios is micromanaging um, yeah. or a tendency to micromanage. And what, what, is that, what does that in effect do to employees? Yeah. <laughs> um, so micromanagers, the definition is someone who does your work for you uh, or, does, or tells you so much detail that it's as if you're just filling in the, you're connecting the dots. And, uh, you know, some jobs that, that makes sense. Automation actually does that to some extent, but for managerial jobs, for leadership jobs, for people that want to have a bigger impact, want to have some of their own personal capability, it's the last thing you want to do. And um, uh, and I found, you know, that super boss leaders, uh, they were hands on. It's kind of one of these paradoxes, I call them hands on delegators. They were very big delegators, which means they're not micromanagers, but they were also hands on. They were involved with people. Uh, they uh, they they did some of that partnering that I just that I just described. But if you're if if you fall into this this trap, I mean, it's a losing formula. If you're going to start doing other people's jobs for them, uh, how are you ever going to survive? Right. You know, when people right. tell me that the number one thing when when people tell me, you know, uh, uh, I don't trust my team, or I've run out of time, or I, I'm working day and night, uh, it gets down to trust, doesn't it? That you don't trust your team, and you're not delegating enough. And usually, not always, but usually it's self-inflicted. Right, right. So trust is the main issue there. Well, I think we're actually out of time, so I'll switch back over to Peter. But thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I think we are at our time's end now. So we should probably, first of all, do a virtual thank you for Sydney for being with us. Sydney Finkelstein is the Stephen Roth Professor and Head of the Executive Education Program at the Tuck School at Dartmouth and joining us today like everyone is by video. Thanks very much for being with us, Sydney. And we will have this uh, up uh, shortly, I hope, on YouTube. You'll see some of this in Knowledge of Wharton as well. And we look forward to following up with you when we do this one again and sending out those announcements. Thank you all very much for being with us and uh, hope to see you again soon. <laughs>